Good evening, everyone. I have to say, massive turnout. And before we get started, I would love to know why you are here. Is it because it's about Azure? Is it because it's about networking? Okay. Is it for the speakers, possibly? Or was it just for the free pizza? <laughs> One guy is honest, at least. So uh, welcome everyone to this Azure user group presentation on Azure networking. My name is Niels Fransens. I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft, uh, focusing on all Azure solutions. But my main area of expertise is infrastructure as a service and networking. And I'm very glad to have Christoph Renner with me, who is a senior technical evangelist uh, at Microsoft as well. So before we get started, a quick word on the Azure user group, which is an open group, which you are all free to join. Just go to azure.be and subscribe. There are multiple sessions um, every year covering a broad range of topics. So if you're interested in Azure, please go to the Azure website. Happy to mention our sponsors and even more happy to announce the Cloud Brew which is a full day working with uh, Azure. Different uh, topics will be covered by multiple speakers from the community. And because it's a cloud brew, there will be beer tasting as well. So maybe that's another reason to join us. About the agenda for today. So the agenda for today is uh, split up in two pieces. One part is me and Christophe boring you to hell with Azure networking. And part two is us laughing with you guys designing a networking solution on Azure. So part two will be hands-on. You have, must have seen these flip charts. Um, so we will split you up in teams, uh, in 10 teams uh, of about five to six people per team. And when you got in, you got, all got handed a piece of paper. And if you don't have one, uh, run out after the session and get a piece of paper, because that piece of paper contains one, the challenge for the solution you have to design, and two, also your group number, to make sure that you're split evenly, uh, so you get to network with other people from the community. Then at 8.30, we get back here together. We'll present the proposed solution for the design challenge, and then we'll have the fun to network with people this time. So about the presentation for today, we'll discuss uh, Azure networking. I always love to start with this wonderful slide showing you all Azure solutions, and I marked the tiny piece that we'll be covering today. Uh, and even on that tiny piece, we could spend more than one day, so we'll be condensing it all. So starting with the networking big picture. So networking in Azure is all software defined, and the basis for that networking is a virtual network. And you can look at the, vir as, at the virtual network as really your own private network in Azure. You can define your own IPs, you can define your own subnets, you can bring all your virtual appliances that you like, you can all store them in Azure, having them either privately accessible or publicly accessible. So when we talk about the front-end piece, so the piece of your end customers connecting to public endpoints of your service, there are a lot of services that we need to cover. So there's a CDN, public IP addressing, load balancing, uh, firewalling, access control. And then on the other side, we have a private connectivity part where we connect your offices and your data centers via a private link to Azure, which can either be internet-based using a VPN technology or even a fully dedicated solution uh, that we call Express route that Christoph will cover in a minute in a little bit more detail. So when we take a closer look at a virtual network within Azure, we really want to stress that this solution is a bring your own network solution. So you can define your own private IP space. So what we suggest you to do and take this into account for the workshop as well, is to reserve in your IP addressing scheme a certain address space that you dedicate to Azure, that those IP addresses don't conflict with what you currently have, and that, that can be fully integrated in your current network infrastructure. When we talk about, for instance, DNS, we offer an Azure-based DNS solution using our DNS servers, 
but you are free to use your own DNS servers as well. Those can either be hosted in Azure, which is fully possible, but you could even, if you have a private connection between your network and Azure, leverage your own existing DNS servers that you have on premise. Same thing holds for AD, so Active Directory, and a lot of other services. When we talk about security, and we'll go a little bit deeper into security as well, Azure offers per default a uh, layer force firewall in Azure, which uses the concept of network security groups, which are basically ACLs. So you define from this IP to that IP, I want this port to be able to connect to that port. That's a basic network security group. And within your virtual network, you have the ability to control the traffic flow as well. So you have the influence to influence the, um, the routing table. So if we look at that a little bit more of detail, imagine you have a solution, two subnets within one virtual network. Per default, all machines in the subnets will be able to communicate with each other. So there's a full routed network between them. But imagine a case where you don't want your front-end subnet to be able to communicate directly with your back-end subnet. You want to have your own firewall appliance or an IDS system in between the traffic flow. Um, then you have a concept called user-defined routes, where you have the possibility to introduce in the networking um, path of that packet a virtual appliance or another VM defining a route, if there's traffic going to that IP address, I want that traffic not to, not to use the default Azure route table, but I want that traffic to be sent through a virtual appliance and then the virtual appliance can do the further routing in the network path. Those virtual appliances are both possible for internal traffic, so going from one subnet to another, as well with uh, traffic entering or leaving your Azure network space. So meaning you can have your own firewall sitting in front of uh, your Azure web servers, or you can have your own proxy server controlling the network traffic leaving your Azure network space. When we talk about those virtual appliances, there's a very cool concept called multiple network interface cards for uh, virtual machines, meaning that you can have one firewall or other appliances residing in multiple of your subnets. So you, have, you can have the same security mechanisms that you have on premise, just replicating them in Azure with a virtual appliance with multiple interfaces in multiple subnets. And on each of those interfaces and each of those um, subnets, you can define different network security groups. So different ACLs to limit or control your traffic flow. So I think when we look at cloud and you have different connectivity options, uh, these are the four ones. Uh, we'll go more in depth about each one of those a little bit later. But of course, I think it's clear that if you're using public cloud, that of course the first type of connectivity you can choose is internet-based connectivity. Nothing really special to talk about. It's really about these other three that are the valuable most in, in your setup. So first of all, you can go for a point-to-site VPN. I always try to see that as being an option for a developer, somebody who wants to connect to a dedicated VNet, wants to manage some virtual machines. Imagine that you have some machine in the cloud running with Visual Studio or with anything on to do your development, and you would like to securely connect to it, point to site could be a valuable option, but don't see it as a good solution for production workloads. Don't see it as an option that you would choose in real enterprise class networking. Could be a tip when, uh, when uh, designing your solution later. The two which would be enter enterprise class great is site to site and uh, express route. Site to site being you have a gateway in the cloud, being virtual, and you have a device on premises. And basically, they were going to create an IPsec tunnel between both of them, creating a dedicated connection which is 24/7, which is always up. And you have the opportunity basically to do encryption, to do all the security stuff which you are used to do. And I think from a support point of view, we support basically every appliance that you can think of on premises. But a good tip, if you're designing your solution for specific customers, always look into the supported list of devices because we have both support for IKV1 and IKV2 tunnels, if you know it, if you know about that. So think about that when designing. If you need an IKV2 uh, V2 tunnel, which we'll be seeing when you design the, the solution later, and you have a device which doesn't support it, you might get into trouble. So that's the first thing that I would check if you talk about a, to a customer about setting up a VPN connection. 
checking between IXV1 and IXV2. So even the bigger Cisco guys, Cisco Azas, tend to have sometimes only V1 or V2 support. So of course, uh, this is great, but uh, the, the speed in which you can connect is still going over public internet. It's layer three connectivity. So the maximum speed that you can get today out of the gateway is 200 megabit, which could be enough for your business. But of course, that's the maximum you can do. If you want to go above 200 megabits, yeah, you need to look into other options. And that's the last option, which we call Express Drive. Has anybody already had the joy to implement Express Drive? And I clearly said the joy. Still fingers, okay? So um, I know that we have one of our providers in the room today. Who was, uh, it's one of our biggest, bigger ones who is offering Express Drive. So it's the guys from Colt. So if you want to know more about what it means in terms of getting that physical connectivity, we have three of them here. So you can, uh, can ask them questions if you want to. Um, so looking at why do we, do we want to implement Express Files, it's really for this mission critical workloads to get not dedicated performance, but to get a, a kind of um, predictable performance. So don't think of it as being, I take an Express Files circuit, a physical connection between your data center and ours, and I get a guaranteed latency, a guaranteed throughput, see it more as a predictable latency and predictable throughput. And I always look at it, I had a customer who was having a side-to-side -side VPN, uh, some, some solution in Azure, and basically they were suffering some days, they had the lowest latency possible, a few milliseconds, and other days it was a couple of seconds. It was a connection from Europe into Japan, so it was not very predictable. When moving into uh, Express Flight, it will still not be faster than light, which makes sense. So it will still be around 150 milliseconds, but you will have that as a predictable. It will always be around 150 milliseconds. So see it as, as being <coughs> enabled for these types of scenarios. So uh, when looking at Express Route in more detail, because that's one of our more solid uh, solutions that you can have. If you look at the comparison between site to site VPN and Express Route, the tipping point in price is, is not going to be that difficult. It's not going to be that big. So sometimes it's even going to be cheaper to go for an express route than to go for a site-to-site -site VPN. So I will always look at an express route as an option before saying, no, we just go for site-to-site -site VPN. So looking at how it works, um, you can really see it theoretically as being, you take a fiber, you put it over your shoulder, you plug it into the data center of the customer, and you plug it into the Microsoft data center. That's a theoretical model. Of course, that's, uh, some people don't know that, but Express Route already exists for many, many years, even though it has, it's known as Express Route for the past two, three years. It already exists for five, six, perhaps even seven years. The moment uh, a customer is dedicatedly connected to our data centers, that was not called Express Route, but the fiber already existed. But the software layer on top of it, which automates the, the fact that we can connect these customers in a high scalable way, that's what we call Express Route. So the software component, like Neil said, it's all software defined, that's basically what's called Express Route, nothing more, you see? So how does it work? Basically you have the customer network and it can be a customer owning devices, having the capability to configure these, uh, these fibers himself, or it can be a customer of any big telco who is on an MPLS network, who has different branch offices, and being connected already to WAN, and you're going to take that WAN and extend it into the Microsoft Cloud, right? So the first option is, the first thing you do is basically you go to a partner edge. The reason for this is that if we want to connect all these million customers straight into our data centers, it's, it's going to be impossible for us to manage. So that's why we have chosen several partners around the globe who are better in that than we are. We are not a telco, so we work together which if you look at the international ones, BT, we look at Colt, we look at Verizon. If you look at the local players, any local telco today has, has in some way an express route offering. Proximus, Telnet, looking at these, all have some kind of express route offering, so which, is, which is great, so we have plenty of options. So basically what happens is you connect to their data center, they have a router in place, and their router is or their own or is Microsoft owned. In the bigger ones, we own our router, we put it in their data center, and their router is directly patched onto ours with Ethernet. And basically, you as a customer, you come with your fiber, you plug in into or the, the router of the customer, and they patch you through to ours, or you 
plug it directly into the, the router of, of Microsoft, depending on the speed you have. And that's why you see physical fiber connections over 10 GB. And that's why you can have a range ranging from 50 megabits into 10 GB, depending on what, how you're going to use uh, the multiplexing on the fiber. So that's the first setup. So basically the customer connection will be between the partner and the Microsoft Edge. And of course, looking at that, the first option that you have is to go to virtual networks. The part Niels explains. So if you look at infrastructure as a service, you design your virtual network, you put your subnets, your virtual machines there, you have a dedicated private connection into that virtual, in, into that virtual network so you can access these virtual machines as they would be part of your own network. So that's the first one. This is the same as you get with a site-to-site -site VPN. The difference is it does not go over public internet. It has a speed which ranges to 10 GB and not to 200 megabits capped, but it does not do encryption. So that's the thing, site-to-site -site VPN is encrypted by default. You can, set it, you can turn it off, but it's not the, probably not the best ID. But uh, express route is not encrypted in transit. So data will flow in plain text over the wire. The reason for it is layer two, and they assume that layer two is more secure than public internet. That's why it's not encrypted. If you want to do it, you have to put IPsec on top of ExpressRoute. That's a takeaway that some people don't realize, but in terms of security, both are, are just as fine. So that's private peering, exactly the same as site-to-site -side VPN. But what you get on top with ExpressRoute, what you don't get with site-to-site -side VPN is also connection to other services, which we host in the same data centers. So you get access to um, all public IP addresses which reside in Azure which means that's what we call public peering, which means you get access to all the platform as a service services, the slide which Neil showed, the top part, where you can access Azure SQL database, web apps, machine learning, any service which we host today as a software as a service or platform as a service and access it as it would be part of your own network through the same pipe, the same, uh, the same mechanism, right? And then the third one, the third one we offer is called Microsoft Peering, and there's a thing specifically about that. So Microsoft Peering is the one which we, which we use for Office 365. It allows you basically to access Office 365 services, Exchange, SharePoint, whatever, through that same pipe. Small remark there, you need to have approval from our networking team before you can enable Express Route for Office 365 due to network complexity and routing issues. It's very, uh, we only allow you to deploy it if we approve you after a network assessment. That's to avoid issues. Now, I, I, I'm talking about peering. So peering um, is, the reason is how ExpressRoute works. If you look at a site-to-site -site VPN, by default, it's like a, a router which you configure. So basically, on your source and your destination, you configure how we should find the other site. So basically, on your source, you configure the address pool of the destination, in the destination, you configure the address pool of the source. Express route works differently because if you're in a complex network setup, imagine that you have plenty of networks that need to connect to each other, and each network that wants to reach the other needs to know who to reach. It's basically going to be extremely difficult to manage in terms of routing. So, how do we solve that in Express Route? It's basically based on BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol. So, basically, we change around how that works. So, instead of the source configuring who the destination is, the destination is going to tell the source, this is me, you can reach me on these addresses. These are all the prefixes I know. If you want to route traffic, you can route it to me on these prefixes. Which also means that if there's a new machine, a new service, a new subnet, whatever, added into that virtual network, that automatically it gets announced on that, on that link. And the source or all the sources know each other by that way. So it's a, the, mechan the mechanism is a little bit turned around, but it gives a, lot, um, a much more flexible and solid networking design. So looking at uh, the partners we have, we have plenty. Um, so these are all the ones, the local ones, like the, the proximities are not on this list yet, uh, but they should be. Um, and then uh, basically when you connect to Express Route, you always select one specific location to connect to. So you select, I would like to connect to Western Europe, I would like to connect to Dublin. You always connect to one single physical location because it's a physical connection, which means if you design your solution later, think about high availability and how you would work around single point of failures, right? Um, so what's the, what's the advantage? Um, as well, you can have one single physical pipe called ExpressRoute and use it 
to have traffic in multiple subscriptions, multiple virtual networks, and really create a network out of these VNets. While with site-to-site -site VPN, we have to connect each one of these sites, virtual, the virtual networks, to one another to have a complete routing domain. With Express Route, you just connect them to the same physical link, and as they all talk BGP, they all start, start exchanging their IP ranges, and routing magically happens, automatically happens. It's basically how internet works. It's, uh, it's the same. And like we said, it's dedicated bandwidth between 50 megabits and 10 gigabits. So that's the range which you can have. And uh, the latency is predictable, but not guaranteed. So of course, what we see quite often is that you use them in coexistence. There are two scenarios in which you can use it. You can use internet connectivity and site-to-site -site VPN as being your backup in case something happens with your peer on location. You're peering with a physical location, so imagine that a comet drops in Europe and that location is gone. Then you have to route back to your source at your destination. Secondly, a good reason to have coexistence is in migration scenarios. What we see quite often is that a customer starts with a site-to-site -site VPN in place. They experiment with Azure, they, they get some machines up and running, their ADs, their ADFSs, whatever, and they feel confident in moving more workloads to the cloud, but they're still with their site-to-site -site VPN. Of course, what you do is you, in coexistence mode, you add Express Route on top of that, and it will replace site-to-site -site VPN. That's why you can have them coexist on the same network. And that's a little bit how the topology looks like. So uh, you see that you will still have uh, your, your gateway and the gateway in Azure, which you will need in your assignment, it's still needed. Even though you do Express Route, you still need a gateway, which will do all the routing and all the BGP, right? Now, this is Express Route. Um, it's probably one of the most complex services that we have today. I'm pretty sure that it's probably the complex one that we have. So, um, and I see Niels nodding. It's, yeah, it's very complex to set it up properly, but uh, you see you get a lot of value, a lot of benefits out of that. Now, looking at all of this, uh, I mentioned a few times security as well. When looking at how networking and uh, Azure is working in terms of security, this is a little bit the schema that you can use to, to visualize how this works. So on the inside, you have cloud services and virtual machines, which is basically what you will host yourself, you manage it. The first layer that you hit is a virtual machine firewall. So if you encounter an issue in configuring your machine or exposing a service, RDP, HTTP, whatever, it's probably the Windows firewall, the, the first, the machine firewall that is blocking your outbound or inbound request. That's the first place to look for when you have an issue. That's always the first place that you forget to open, right? Secondly, it's the network security groups. So Niels has explained briefly what network security groups are. So a network security group is the software defined firewall that we offer you for free as part of the virtual networking, where you can enable rules like inbound HTTP, outbound, whatever. And I would always recommend customers to use NSGs as being your first layer of defense and create a subset of rules that you think are super crucial to your network, but you don't want to overcomplex these things. So for instance, what we see quite often is an NSG to block outgoing internet traffic and to block incoming internet traffic. That would be a great one to start with um, because the auditing capabilities, the logging capabilities are a little bit more limited than what you get with these virtual appliance that we just talked about. Then of course, you have the virtual network isolation, which means that any virtual network that you create in Azure is a dedicated tenant and has no means to communicate with any other virtual network, except if you connect both of them together or with a side-to-side -side VPN connecting both or when connecting them to the same express route circuit. So, which means that if you connect two virtual networks to the same express route circuit, they will belong to the same routing domain which means that if you don't put any NSGs or security in place, they can route traffic to each other. It's a question that we get quite often from hosters and from customers that say, yeah, what if I, if I offer hosting services to my customers? Can I have multiple virtual networks from all my customers linked to the same physical circuit? Yes, you can, but we don't support that. If you want to take the risk in, secure, in security and want some customers to see other customers' routes, perfectly fine, but that's why we don't support that scenario because of security. Everybody can write to everybody. Then on the outside world, of course, you have ACLs, the access control lists, which enable you to say, okay, I would like to have inbound port 80 and it has to redirect to that, to that load balance or to that virtual machine. 
coming to be at RDP, whatever. And then, of course, on the outside, we have DDoS, the denial of service protection, which has been scaled. It's, it's part of the of Azure, of every service that you use in Azure, and it's capable of dealing with billions of requests per second. Uh, it's completely transparent. We don't document that specific for a specific reason because it's a security component. We don't document that very deeply, but we have some some basic documentation which says we do DDoS protection for you, and we are able to manage billions of requests. Nobody knows. Very good brief side on the DDoS. We can. The DDoS protection you see on this slide is actually designed to protect Azure as a platform from the attacks. So meaning, imagine I'm a bank. I put a web application on Azure, and there are some hackers who decide I will attack that web application on Azure. Our DDoS protection is designed to make sure that all the other customers do not um, do not get influenced by that DDoS attack of another customer on Azure. We do not guarantee with that DDoS protection that your application will remain live, and that the DDoS traffic specifically for your application will be black -holed. So this actually means that if you host an application and you are confident that Microsoft will handle the DDoS attack <coughs> adequately, and you can accept a limited amount of time from your application during the DDoS attack, that's perfectly fine for you. But if you desire another, if you really desire DDoS protection, for your specific application, so for your specific endpoints, you need a dedicated DDoS solution. We have some in our offerings with, uh, for instance, the CDN, we offer a part of with Akamai, which can offer you DDoS protection specifically for your application. But please do not make the mistake of thinking that this DDoS um, protection is enough for your application if you ever get that. Okay. The same for IDS and IPS, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems. We have them in our edge. We do it transparently for everybody. If you want to have full control on what happens there, you have to deploy one yourself. So again, a hint for the solution that you're going to design. So um, this is basically the, the layered security that we apply uh, on all services. Now looking in more depth on these network security groups, which you will need, it's basically a, a little bit like this schema where you have a five tuple ACL that you can define. So basically you have a source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port, and a protocol being TCP or UDP. That's the five tuples that you can configure in making the, the traffic work. That's the only thing that you can cover uh, configure today. But you're perfectly fine to design these types of solutions where you have, for instance, a front end, which is your DMZ, which will be able to communicate with the internet and receive traffic from the internet, communicate securely with your mid-tier and your backend, but your backend and your mid-tier will not be able to communicate outbound to the internet and receive inbound uh, internet connectivity. Uh, of course, if you want to reach them, you have VPN and express route in place. So that's, uh, that's how you segment network traffic between different layers. Uh, of course, we now see it as one big virtual network. Niels will show you in the end how we can even create this same topology using multiple virtual networks. That's also what we sometimes see, a dedicated virtual network for DMZ, a dedicated virtual network for internal stuff, so that you can segment this network even further. And that's uh, what Niels is going to show. Of course, we told you, you have the basic networking security. If you want to go further than that and you want to do DDoS yourself, you want to do in-depth firewalling, auditing on some rules, you want to go, uh, you want to do IDS, IPS yourself, of course, you need a way to deploy these solutions, and that's what we call network virtual appliance or, or virtual network appliance, depending on, uh, on our acronyms, which we sometimes uh, have for everything. Um, so basically, what is it? It's a virtual machine with a specific networking function. We don't offer these, but we offer a marketplace where you can get all of these solutions. All the big ones, like F5, the big IP, you can get the Barracudas and Gs, you can a checkpoint, whatever, all these types of solutions, we offer them is the provider and the, the, the maker of these solutions that is offering it to our marketplace, certified, making sure that it's perfectly fine for Azure. And within a few clicks, you can provision those, deploy them into your network, and have immediately protection using your existing license and your existing management console of what you're using on premises and exactly the same features as you have in the cloud. That's what the transparency is that we are offering. So um, now the, the good thing is that um, 
in many of these solutions, you have a free trial mode in the marketplace, so you can just take it, install it. Uh, I see Yuri from Barracuda, so if you want to know how it works, then you can ask him. Uh, they, uh, they have, for instance, uh, one of the, the most successful uh, security appliances, which is today in the Azure marketplace, which I mean, successful, I mean the most used by our customers, is uh, the Barracuda NG firewall. Uh, if I'm correct, you also have a web application firewall, and with a couple of clicks, you can enhance your security in your solution by deploying this virtual machine. You can try it out because there's a trial license for 30 days, probably. Uh, if and, and later on you choose or you do a pay as you go, you pay the license per hour, which gives you the flexibility of the cloud, or you bring your own license if you already have it. If you have the management console running on premises, you just connect these existing appliances to the same console. They have a full transparent environment where it's running in the public cloud or whether it's running on premises or even on other clouds, which I didn't see. Um, for most of them, they are Linux based um, for good reason. I shouldn't say that either. And, um, but just think about it. If you want to have basic security, look at NSGs. If you want to go more in depth, like imagine that you would like to know yesterday something happened with my user, he was unable to access a certain service, what happened? You would like to go in depth with these security rules and, and fine tune them, look at these, uh, these appliances. So how does it look like if you look at the networking scheme? This is more or less how you design it. So basically you have multiple uh, Azure, you have the cross premises uh, connectivity, and then you have these, uh, these solutions from the big guys uh, like Fortinet, Checkpoint, Barracuda, F5, to basically protect or hook up in different flavors of your network, specifically on the edge, like a web application firewall for incoming traffic, or specifically a firewall solution between subnets, like the NG or the F5 Big IP. So this is basically what you will also be needing in your assignment, which we'll do. So uh, to, uh, to end, before we switch into that, I'm going to give the word back to Nils, who is going to, uh, to take you a little bit to what's new in Azure Networking. Because as you know, today it's Ignite, which was the, the, the best possible time you could have, because at the same moment we are doing our session, the two gurus and the designers of our networking stack are doing a similar session. Uh, so Nils is going to, to highlight a few of these announcements that we are going to make today, and to share you a little bit on what we are working on and what you can expect in the coming weeks. Yes. Thanks. So I have three services here that are new within the Azure networking stack. Two of them actually already exist. Keep calm, keep calm. <laughs> Two of them actually already exist. One is fresh of the press being announced right now at Ignite. So as Christoph said, the networking gurus are having their session right now. So I don't know if my announcement will be prior to theirs or not. So it's the last announcement. But first question, who of you ever heard the phrase cloud is not secure? Heard the phrase, heard it. Whoever said it? Himself. <laughs> so I hear the phrase Azure or cloud in general is not secure and I have a slide, but the slide doesn't really ma matter. But there's a very cool new feature in Azure, which went uh, generally available in July, called the Azure Security Center. I actually don't know what's on the slide. I just wanted the slide to highlight it. Azure Security Center is a console you get showing you the health status of your Azure environment, doing two types of checks, one type of pre uh, of proactive checks. So really looking into how your solution is set up today. It does checks on your Azure setup itself. So it checks, do you have network security groups in place? Are those network security groups that you have in place not too generalistic? For instance, allowing RDP from everyone around the world. If you have that rule open, I guarantee that you'll be hacked. So it does those types of checks. It also does checks within your virtual machine. If your virtual machine is running on the latest Microsoft updates, if you have NP malware on those virtual machines, if you have the Windows firewall configured on those machines, so it does one of the checks is proactive, looking at what's in place right now. There's a second piece in the security center as well, and that's actually the coolest part, that does checks on what is happening with that environment. So it looks into the Azure network traffic that is flowing. It does looks into your virtual machine, which processes are running and which process dumps uh, were collected by Windows 
to do checks on whether or not you could possibly be under attack. So for instance, one of the scenarios is you have a server running on Azure and from one day to the other, we notice that there are a thousand SMTP packets. So SMTP is outgoing mail packets per minute that we notice from one point to the other. It's possible that you just set up a mail server on Azure, so that's perfectly fine. But it's also possible that you were hacked and that somebody is sending spam mails from your virtual machine. So in that case, you have with the Azure Security Center a dashboard showing you which traffic flows or what's happening within your virtual machines that's not running as it should be. The Azure Security Center also integrates with some partner offerings. For instance, it does integration with Barracuda so that the logs from the virtual firewalls are also sent and processed by the security center of Azure. Uh, and what's actually really cool about this is that it's based fully on machine learning and the base info we used to create the security was actually based on all those error logs we have all been sending Microsoft since the launch of XP. So we have a lot of data to use to uh, see which sorts of process dumps or processes are yeah, uh, viruses. And we can do, based on all the data we have with machine learning in the back end, we can actually do very good scans on what's happening on, um, within your virtual machines and on, the, and on the network. And just to show you, Microsoft is really investing heavily within security. They're doing every year about $1 billion in investment in security. And this is just one of the yeah, features that's coming out of that investment. Uh, Second cool thing um, that was released uh, during the summer, so this feature is still in preview, is a feature called VNet Peering. And just to get a sense of the audience, who of you know what's the difference between, between ASM and ARM, or Azure Classic and New Azure? Who thinks that's a pain in the dark hole? <laughs> so the VNet Peering uh, solution that was announced in July is one of Microsoft ways to help you deal with that pain. What you can do with VNet peering is if you have a VNet existing in classic, so that's the top VNet over there, you can have a direct network peering with an ARM VNet. You could already connect those VNets uh, using a side-to-side -side VPN in the past, but then you were, as Christoph said, limited to 200 megabits per second. You had additional gateways in the path, so you had additional latency, you didn't have enough bandwidth, and those gateways had a certain cost as well. VNet peering is a feature designed to offer you a very low latency and high bandwidth link between those VNets. And I did a test back in August of the um, of the network latency and the bandwidth, and the bandwidth between two virtual machines in the same VNet and the bandwidth between two machines in VNet that were peered was exactly the same. So you could reach the full bandwidth that your virtual machine has, and the network latency was comparable. In one of my tests, and I think that was not representative, the traffic going over the peered link was actually faster than over the regular link. But this feature will allow you to peer VNets uh, within the same region. So it's not designed to peer across regions. You will still need either Express Route or a VPN to do connections across regions. Uh, so it works within the same region. And you can connect up to 10 peers per VNet. But the peering uh, relationship is non-transitive. So if you look at this picture, um, the first VNet will be able to talk to the other ones. The other ones will be able to talk in the other direction, but if you want to have traffic flowing between the classic VNet and the ARM VNet, you will need to set up either a peering relationship between both of those VNets or configure a sort of router in the ARM VNet. My recommendation is just set up another peering link, that will be easier, but um, both are possible. What's also possible with the peering is to do sort of gateway transits. So imagine you're in a site-to-site -site VPN scenario, if you want to have a site-to-site -site connectivity to multiple VNets, you need to have one VPN per Azure VNet. And those VPNs, you need to configure, you need to manage them, you need to monitor them to see if they're still up. What you can achieve with VNet peering is you can do a gateway transit, which means that 
The second VNet we have right here, so the ARM VNet will be able to use the VPN gateway of the first VNet. This is something that's only possible ARM to ARM, not in ASM to ARM. So not from classic to new model, just as a brief side note. And the last thing is something that's really new, that's uh, IPv6 support on Azure. I don't know who thinks this is really awesome. See some hands going up. So IPv6 support will be announced, I think, right now. I hope I'm not speaking before my term. The documentation on this is already live, but basically what we offer right now is native IPv6 support on Azure virtual machines and Azure load balancers. This means that uh, the, the virtual machines and the load balancers will be dual stacked, so they will accept both uh, IPv4 and IPv6 packets. So you can just have your current infrastructure, which is currently using IPv4, also using IPv6 in the future. The functionality is right now still in public preview, so you can test it out, but it's still a preview functionality. But really to note that this IPv6 support is native IPv6 support, so there's no uh, gateway sitting in front of it doing a translation from, v from v6 to v4, so you'll get the same types of performance as in, v, as in IPv4 with IPv6, because it's, it's a native support. Supported both on machi virtual machines, load balancers, and of course you can also use uh, network security groups on this traffic, but the only thing you'll need to change is the IP addresses, because a network security group on IPv4 cannot be the same as an IPv6, because you have other physical addresses, actually. I saw some frowning, or was the last remark not really that clear about the network security groups? Going forward? Okay. So, uh, this was a really short talk discussing Azure networking in less than an hour. If you want some more uh, documentation on Azure networking, there are some uh, great uh, poster presentations. Uh, that's the top link, aka.ms slash cloud architecture discussing on um, high-level view all the details you need to know to design an Azure networking solution. Those posters you have for uh, networking and security, but also for some other solutions like identity and, for instance, uh, storage designs. There is, as well, very good documentation on the Azure documentation for networking. It's really detailed with a lot of examples, both showing you the portal, PowerShell, ARM templates. So that's really good documentation. And the last two links I show are two very good presentations. One is about ExpressRoute, covering ExpressRoute from A to Z in 30 minutes. And I've seen presentations on ExpressRoute that lasted one hour and a half that weren't quite as detailed as this show. So I recommend you all, if you want to know more about ExpressRoute, go to that link. And the last link I show you is a talk uh, from Mark Rustinovich, who's the CTO of Azure who talks at the Open Networking Summit about our software-defined network design uh, within Azure. And he also discusses during that presentation uh, network design that we have been implementing for some years using uh, FPGAs in our Azure networking stack. So I don't know, who of you know what an FPGA is? See some hands. So what an FPGA is, is basically it's a program programmable chip. So as you possibly know, the CPU in your, uh, in your computer is based on a lot of logical chips and a lot, lot of logical wiring between them. What an FPGA is, it's all sorts of ports. So you have the AND, NOT, and, um, and, not and OR ports. And what you can achieve with an FPGA is you can, using some computer code, program physical, uh, physical electronics on such a chip. And what this allows us to do is using an FPGA, we can offload a lot of the network traffic that would normally flow through uh, the CPU into the physical chip, allowing us much faster network throughputs. And you can expect, and then that's just an expectation, some more info coming from Microsoft about this with some announcements about possibly some higher networking speeds. But I would say, just wait a couple of days and you'll see some things appearing. So just to summary, as a summary, Azure networking is great, cool, enterprise ready with a global scale and offering you complete solutions. So the full network design you can have on premise can also be replicated into Azure. 
And we have a very strong partner network, both with telecommunication partners, locally and globally, as with uh, software vendors offering their security appliances on Azure. So now over to part two of our very fun evening, which will be the workshop. So starting with some practical notes for the workshops. Um, as I said in the beginning, for those of you who don't yet have a paper with the challenge on there, uh, there should be some more at the reception desk. Um, you can get them after the, after the introduction, uh, which will be your team number. Uh, there are 10 flip charts uh, placed throughout the building. Six are in this room and four are in a room next door where Christophe will take you uh, after the presentation. There are three proctors uh, who can help you if you have any questions uh, during, the, during the workshop. You have Christophe, you have myself and Thomas, if you could please stand up. <laughs> oh, yeah, and Bert as well, who's standing in the back. But he's not that technical, so don't ask him any questions. So uh, let me quickly go over the, over the case study we'll be handling, which is a real world case study. So step one will be reviewing the case study, of course. So uh, we have Woodgrove Financial Services, which is a bank in the United States, operating from both the United States as from Mexico. They've been existing over 75 years. And yeah, as they are a bank, they are typically very risk averse. But as you all know, the banking industry is changing a lot in the last couple of years after the financial crisis. And the bank needs to become more and more digital. They need to have, offer more services, they need to offer them faster, and they need to offer them in a secure fashion. And that's why the CIO has chosen to go to Azure, but he has some concerns and he wants to see a full network design. And that will be your task for this evening, to design um, a full network design for Woodgrove Financial Services to support them in their move to a more digital environment. So looking at their situation, so as I said, they have a new president who wants to modernize the image. So I think most of them this week covered. So they are headquartered in Chicago in yeah, the United States uh, and they have branches all over the, the US and Mexico operating a total branch network of 225 branches which are all connected using one MPLS network. So if we look at a quick picture of their current network architecture, they have three data centers, all with a specific IP range, which is also on your uh, sheet. So we have a data center in Texas, one in Illinois and one in Mexico. And the connections that happen are both using an MPLS connection and a failover using a site-to-site -site VPN running over the internet. And some of the branches, particularly in Mexico, only use a site-to-site -site connection. So they're not connected through the MPLS, but the data center in Mexico is connected to, uh, with an MPLS link to the data centers in the United States. So if we have a look at the application landscape for this bank, we took out four of their applications. One is their core banking application, which is a basic client server application uh, using a SQL Server 2014. They have their website, which is the online banking, of course, and that's running on a web farm currently in the company's uh, data center and, of course, interacting securely with the backend application servers. And here the keyword is securely with the backend application servers. They also have an HR system based on an uh, Oracle based data tier and you're free to do with that data tier whatever you want. <laughs> and the last part is email. They're currently using email uh, on Exchange Server 2010, and they're asking you what's the best solution to handle their email traffic in the future. So if you look at their needs, they have actually four needs. One is they want to have a detailed architecture on how they can connect their sites and their current data centers to Azure. Second need is to have an overview of what their network setup in Azure will look like. Third need is a detailed design that will allow their applications to interact and to have an application running on Azure or on premise and having all of that looking very uh, working seamlessly. 
And the last need they have is that all their outbound IP traffic needs to be screened by a physical appliance, so not a virtual appliance. And that physical appliance will remain on-premise for the foreseeable future. And they want to know how we will handle all the outgoing traffic from their service in Azure being routed through their physical scanning device remaining on-premise. So they have some objections to why not use Azure. So the objections are is that they're reluctant to use Azure Platform as a Service and Office 365 because those services are public by nature and a bank cannot have all their services being publicly accessible. Certainly, for instance, not their email. They want to have a fully private connectivity for email and they think that's not possible using Azure. Uh, second, the CIO believes that Azure cannot support real enterprise class network designs. Third objection they have is that they cannot monitor internet traffic with the systems based in Azure. And as a last objection, they note that, well, we have an IT organization that has been existing for a couple of years, and we have done a vendor selection for our firewalls and for our routers. We want to, we do not want to repeat that exercise of screening vendors, selecting appliances when we do a cloud migration. So our ask to you is a twofold. One is doing the architecture exercise. So designing the cross connectivity and designing the Azure VNet. And the second part is responding to the customer objections. So having an answer ready when you go presenting to the board and they bring up Azure cannot connect, Azure cannot support enterprise class networking services you need to have an answer ready to respond to that. So the exercise, um, certainly for the, for the architecture part, we divided that up in three levels of difficulty. So we have a level 100, which is the basic, level 200, a little bit more advanced, and level 300 really going to the final solution. So level 100 is really focused on the core networking design. So just the network design on Azure. So taking into account which IP address space will we use, how many subnets do we need? How will we configure to be sure that the front end subnets does not talk to my database system? So those types of questions. Level 200 focuses more on the hybrid connectivity. So how will we connect the virtual network that we create in Azure securely to our on-premise situation? Thinking about possibly a site-to-site -site VPN or express route, and there are some questions and some hints to what you could use in your design. And the level 300 focuses on the real hybrid networking scenario, focusing on their firewall selection, focusing on the question, what do we do with the phys physical screening appliance? And that's really the tough part. So what we want you to do in the next 40 to 45 minutes You'll work out your architecture and a response to the customer objections on the whiteboards. At about a quarter, at about 10 past eight, we'll ask you to present that solution to your neighbor. So we have an even pair of whiteboards. So the people from whiteboard one will present to whiteboard two, and so on. Same goes for the other room. You'll have about seven to eight minutes to do the presentation. Then we'll flip things around have the other team present their solution to the other team, focusing really on what you did differently in your network design. Don't focus on what you did the same because you already, yeah, you did it, you heard it, so it doesn't make sense to repeat it. Focus really on what you did differently and try to teach something new to the other team. When you do the presentations, you have the opportunity to challenge the other team because you have four objections. So you could sit there Look at the presentation, raise your hand and say, I have an objection, please respond. But please take into account that you only have about seven to eight minutes to do the presentation, so don't make it too hard. So in terms of practical details, go meet your team at your designated whiteboard. Every whiteboard has a number, so whiteboards one to six, so teams one to six will remain here. Teams uh, seven through 10 will join Christophe in another room. And then I guess uh, we can get started. Please focus on the quality of your work. It's better to have a good solution on level 100 than to have total crap on level 300. 
And then the last remark, don't sweat over the nitty witty details. Just tend to come up with an architecture. It's a high level architecture showing that you understood what we tried to explain you. So I guess for those of you who don't have an um, information sheet, you can get them at the reception. And otherwise I'd say spread out across the whiteboards. If you have any questions, uh, please reach out to me, Thomas or Christoph.